Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Norquist. We are beyond lucky to have as today's guest, Dr. Rob Henderson, to talk about a really, really difficult but important topic, social class in America. Having first come onto the political scene by coining the term luxury beliefs, Rob recently published his memoir, Troubled, a memoir of foster care, family, and social class. In it, he recounts being placed into the foster care system after childhood abuse, the divorce of his adopted parents in a working class California town, his enlistment at the age of 17, followed by his time at Yale, which he attended after getting out of the military through the GI Bill. Spurred by his experiences, he chose to pursue a PhD in psychology at the University of Cambridge, from which he is a recent graduate. One quick warning, in this conversation, we do discuss a lot of really difficult topics, including those surrounding sex and abuse. So if you're listening, for instance, with small kids, proceed with caution. But with no further ado, I'm so excited to welcome Rob Henderson. Rob, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. Uh, Thanks, Annika. Yeah, great to be here. You've written this really incredible book. Could you kick us off? In your book, you recount growing up in the top 1% most unstable households in the U.S. Um, And it's a long book. You don't need to explain all the gritty details right now. But if you could give our listeners just kind of a bird's eye view so they have a little bit of context for the conversation that we're about to have. Sure. Well, I, mm, I opened the book describing the origins of my name. Um, so my, my first name, Robert, comes from my uh, supposed biological father, uh, who I never met. Uh, I was born into poverty in Los Angeles. And my birth mother and I, we were homeless for a time, and we lived in a car. We eventually settled in a slum apartment uh, in this rundown part of LA. Uh, this was in the early 90s. And that's where my middle name comes from, is my birth mother. So she came to the U.S. from Seoul as a young woman uh, from South Korea. She was intent to study in the U.S., but then started partying and doing a lot of drugs. And her life kind of spiraled out of control. Um, and she was later questioned by some police officers and a forensic psychologist asking her you know, where's this boy's father, uh, me, and she, you know, she wasn't in a position to care for me. uh, And she didn't really know. And so I didn't have any information about my father other than his name. Uh, She said, you know, his his guy is his name's Robert, but she didn't really know where he was or what he did or anything else. I took this uh, 23andMe genetic ancestry test last year. And discover that I'm I'm half Hispanic on my father's side, but I went my entire life not knowing that. Uh, and so, you know, that's all the information I have about him. That's really the only information I have about my mother, too. And then my last name, Henderson, comes from my adoptive father. Um, so after I was taken from my mother and placed into the foster care system in Los Angeles, uh, spent the next... So I was three years old, and I spent the next five years or so living in seven different homes all around Los Angeles. I was later adopted by this uh, working class family in this kind of dusty blue collar town in Northern California called Red Bluff. And my adoptive parents, uh, they raised me for a time. They had a young daughter. She was my younger sister. She became my adoptive sister. She was their biological daughter. Uh, And about 18 months after the adoption, they divorced. And my adoptive father cut off contact with me. Um, He was angry with my adoptive mother for leaving him. And that was his way of retaliating at her was to stop speaking with me. And I was nine years old by that point. And this was this was hard. I mean, you know, so that was kind of the, you know, I, I was adopted in the late 90s. And now I'm kind of familiar with the sociological and ethnographic research on families and communities across the U.S. and how things have been diverging more and more along class lines. So, 
you know, for people with college degrees who are sort of affluent and upper middle class, families are about as stable as they've ever been. Divorce is pretty rare. Single motherhood is pretty rare. But for working class communities, um, they've been kind of deteriorating for decades. And I kind of got a front row seat to that in the late 90s um, to see this in this kind of working class town in Red Bluff. You know, my parents divorced, adoptive parents, but then I described the lives of my friends in this town. And I had five close friends growing up in Red Bluff, and all five of them were not raised by both of their birth parents. They were also in various stages of tumult and disorder with their families, with single parents. And I had one friend raised by his grandmother because his dad was in prison and his mom was on drugs. And, you know, other friends who had, you know, various forms of step parents and quasi parents. And it was really, um, you know, at the time, it, it seemed very normal to me. But it wasn't until later, once I left Red Bluff, joined the military when I was 17, right after high school, after a very kind of you know, shoddy and, and strange, uh, you know, uh, academic, <laughs> uh, experience in school. My grades were kind of fair to middling and barely graduated in the end and, and left when I was 17 enlisted. And then from there went off to Yale on the GI bill and then to, to Cambridge and got a PhD there. Uh, and so it's just been a very kind of strange, unusual, indirect path through higher education. And so the book just covers these experiences and the lessons I've learned, some of the observations I have, and, you know, kind of a, a meta level discussion around social mobility and, and the things that we are focusing on and the things we should be paying more attention to as far as, you know, how we, you know, as far as success, as far as mobility, as far as class, and all of these questions, um, which, you know, we can, we can get into, but that's kind of an overview of, of the book. And you open your book with a quote from, I think it's Nicholas Christakis, that really kind of, I found very jarring, uh, that the reason that our system is set up the way it is, is really about the needs of adults, not children. Um, and there, I mean, I think the most kind of uh, startling example of that for me is someone who knew absolutely nothing about the foster system before reading your book is that purposefully kids are not kept with the same family for very long in the foster care system. So, I mean, again, kind of a lot of your book is kind of recounting what happened and then the hindsight kind of happens at the, at the end. When you look at the stuff that happened to you in your early life, kind of with what you know now as a psychologist and in hindsight, um, what are some ways in which the system doesn't actually prioritize children and instead I mean, you would think it would eventually hurt adults because then kids grow up and have all these issues, but... Which we're kind of seeing now. I mean, we're, we're you know, we've seen, you know, the kind of increase in substance abuse and crime and, and the malaise and the kind of further deterioration of a lot of these communities over the last couple of decades. I mean, that, even that, like Red Bluff compared to when I was a kid, it actually looks worse now. And it was already mm -hmm. in pretty bad shape in the early 2000s, where I recount count my memories of that time. Um, but yeah, that quote from Nicholas Christakis, the physician and sociology professor uh, at Yale. Uh, and, you know, he comes up later in the book as well. Yes. <laughs> um, which we can talk about. Book ends. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, and it was, yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, it's funny how things work out. Um, but that was a, a, yeah, even when I read it, it was a jarring quote, and I kind of lived through what he was describing, where he said, yeah, that uh, family policy and policy around childcare in the U.S. has historically always been about the needs of adults, and what was best for children were of secondary concern at best. Um, and so the foster system, you know, the way it's set up is so... You know, often for, for many, maybe most kids in the system, when they get placed there, it's it's meant to be temporary. It's kind of a stopgap where, you know, you have a kid and they're, you know, usually they don't know who their father is and the mother is on drugs or has a, a mental illness episode. And so the child is removed from the person, you know, the mother's care or the parent's care. And then often someone from the family of origin reenters the picture. It could be the mother sobers up or an aunt or a grandmother or someone kind of reenters the picture and kind of takes care of the kid. And so the way the system is set up is so that the kid doesn't stay with any particular foster family for too long, because if they do, this can create issues around loyalty and attachment that, you know, if a kid stays with a family for six months or a year, and then suddenly say an aunt says, oh, I'll take care of the child or the mom returns and says, I can care for the child. 
uh, and the kid has been with the same family for a year, often they don't want to leave. Um, and often uh, from the foster parents' perspective, they're reluctant to let the child go because they've become emotionally involved and attached. And maybe they're a bit wary about the family of origin and how much adequate care they can supply. And so the system has been kind of it organically developed and evolved to be you know, uh, designed in a way such that a kid will only stay with any given family for a few weeks, maybe a few months at most. And so there's this constant churning and this constant shift, um, kind of creating intentional instability. And, you know, it's, it's hard to say, like, is that the best? I don't know. It's imperfect. It's bad for kids. But is it, you know, compared to the alternative where you might have those issues around loyalty and, you know, it's not an easy question to answer. But in my case, the answer was quite clear what should have been done, which was I should have been placed into the uh, adoptive, yeah, the adoption system much earlier. So again, I was in the foster system for about five years. Uh, and the only reason why I was given up for adoption was because at, at some point I was mandated to see uh, a child psychiatrist. Every so often, you know, the foster care system, a social worker, or someone, uh, they mandate, you know, a kid, if they've been in the system long enough, eventually they have to kind of, you know, basically have their mental health monitored uh, because it's such a, you know, that's a very upsetting experience to be in the system that long, especially at such a young age. And so this doctor looks at my file and basically notices, oh, like, so my mother was deported back to South Korea because she had had multiple run-ins with the law around drugs. And I described some of that in the book. Uh, and my father, you know, no one knew where he was and no one had any idea about the rest of my family. Uh, and so there was no possibility of me being reunited with my family of origin. Uh, but I got sucked into this kind of vast bureaucratic system. The LA County foster care system is, I just read this recently, that it's the most overburdened system in the country. I don't know if this was the case in the 90s, but it was probably, you know, well into the top five, the top three. It was, it was bad even then. Um, and so, you know, the only reason I was put into the adoptive system was this doctor sat down and actually noticed, oh, like this kid has been in the system for so long and there's no possibility of him being replaced with his family. And so he wrote this note in my file saying, I strongly urge Robert to be placed with, you know, with an adoptive family as soon as possible. And so that was what kind of triggered the sequence of events that um, led me to be adopted. But, you know, essentially like we could sort of dedicate more resources and more time and more attentive care to tailor each approach to each individual child and actually look closely at each individual circumstance instead of just, you know, kind of going through the motions and, oh, just, no, oh, the kid, you know, we'll just move them around every few months and not really pay close attention to what the child's individual needs are. Uh, but the system is so overburdened. There aren't enough social workers. There aren't enough families. There's just not enough people or resources or attention. And there's just so many kids who need a home that, you know, it's like the, the priority is like, as long as a kid isn't being actively abused or mistreated, that we'll just kind of, you know, let the system operate as it is and not really get too involved in it. And so that's kind of what happened with me. And this is happening, I think, with a lot of other kids too, more and more kids. I mean, I didn't age out of the system, but if you look at the statistics for kids who age out of the system, they're really abysmal. But statistics in general for a kid who spends any amount of time in foster care are really abysmal. There's one study I describe in the book about how, so overall in the U.S., about 35% of adults uh, obtain a bachelor's degree in the U.S. Uh, and for children raised in families in the bottom income quintile, so the poorest families in the country, uh, kids born into those families, 11% of them graduate from college. And for foster kids, it's only 3%. Uh, so in other words, a child born into a poor family in the US is four times more likely to graduate from college than a kid who has spent any amount of time in foster care. And, you know, it's just, it's just abysmal. And then, you know, 60% of boys in the foster care system are later incarcerated. So if you're a boy in the foster system, you're 20 times more likely to be locked up than to graduate from college. And, you know, I cite statistic after statistic in the early parts of the book and, and towards the end as well, just kind of giving a snapshot overview of kind of what are the typical outcomes for kids in these circumstances, not just foster kids, too. I mean, I talk about kids just in general in kind of chaotic family situations or kids who are raised, 
you know, by unmarried parents in uh, deprived and dysfunctional circumstances that, you know, I described the outcomes of my friends who weren't in the foster system, but were uh, raised in kind of garden variety, broken homes. And it's, um, it's something I think, yeah, more and more educated people who are interested in policy and mobility and, uh, you know, the future of kids in the country, you know, they could pay, pay a bit more, um, you know, concentrate a bit more on this. I want to put a pin in uh, the observation about college, uh, college ad- admission that you make, but I am kind of interested because you referred several times to the fact that it's currently getting worse, which is something that I think a lot of people sense. Um, there's uh, yeah, a general consciousness that for places like inland California, things are currently kind of in a downward spiral. Um, and huge differences, even in my family or people I know, the, the difference in the experience that they had growing up in poverty in the 50s versus the kind of accounts like yours or what you read now. I mean, why do you think that is? And is it going to continue to get worse? So, yeah, that's a question with like, there are like layers to that. <laughs> like I've spoken with I mean, it's so funny. I wrote this um, this op-ed a few years ago. This was back when the New York Times would still occasionally run my essays. Hmm. But I wrote this piece in the New York Times. And then this guy contacted me. He was in his like 80s. Uh, he had graduated from the same high school I did, Red Bluff High, in 1955. Wow. And he was telling me what Red Bluff was like in the 1950s. And it was like, you know, like kind of a still a working class town, blue collar, you know, a lot of people working in jobs, you know, that don't require a college degree. Um, But he was telling me that, like, you know, the kids were poor, working class, but they still were raised by two married parents. Mm -hmm. And they were taught pretty good values. And, you know, kids would get into mischief. And you'd see kids smoking cigarettes or drinking beer. And, you know, you had some of these kind of guys wearing leather jackets and stuff. But, like, generally, it was not this. And then he was describing how he actually visited the high school and I was still a student unbeknownst to him, but he visited Rebel of High in 2005. I was a student there. Uh, wow. Obviously we didn't know each other, but he visited for his 50 year reunion. And he was like, I visited Red Bluff and it was completely different than what I had remembered. Uh, those 50 years, those 50 years, a lot changed in the country, uh, especially for poor and working class families. Um, I cite this statistic in the book uh, in 1960, across social classes, 95% of children were born and raised uh, by both of their birth parents. Wow. Um, regardless of how rich or how poor they were across the socioeconomic spectrum. But then if you fast forward, funny enough, if you fast forward to 2005, for the upper class and upper middle class, basically people who are born to, to college educated parents who have white collar jobs, you know, live in safe areas and so forth, that children born to those families, 85% of them are still raised by both of their birth parents. So slight dip, but essentially families look the same in terms of stability and how intact they are. But for working class families, pe- you know, pe- kids born to parents who didn't go to college, work blue collar jobs, um, it went from 95% in 1960 to 30% in 2005. And my guess is, you know, like you're saying, I think it's actually that number is probably lower now. And I think there are a variety of kind of moving parts to this. I mean, there's probably, there's an economic piece. You know, some people suggest that marriage and intact families have deteriorated in working class communities because, you know, the men uh, who lack college degrees have been able to seek gainful employment and, and earn a comfortable living in order to raise a family. And so, you know, factory jobs and these kinds of jobs have um, become more scarce. And so as a result, these men are less attractive as marriage partners. And so, you know, that's one reason why marriage rates are declining. I'm, I used to buy that more, but I've become a bit more skeptical. There was a great book that came out um, a few months ago called The Two-Parent Privilege by oh, Melissa. Yeah. Really good book. Um, she's great. And in that book, she describes how, um, you know, she reports some research which found, you know, they basically, these, these researchers looked at areas of the country in which there was a fracking boom. And suddenly men, like blue collar men who lacked college degrees, uh, were sought employment and they were gainfully employed in jobs that paid very well. Um, and these researchers sort of monitored the marriage rates uh, in the wake of this fracking boom, and they did not increase at all in these areas. And so essentially, to me, that suggests that there's a, there's a cultural piece here as well, uh, that 
marriage as an institution has become less important over time, that, you know, the, the belief in the two family structure, the confidence in it, the willingness to participate in it, um, for kind of lower income areas. I mean, you know, single parenthood is high, unmarried parenting and all those kinds of things. Uh, this is, this has been a sort of a cultural shift and if you kind of track what happened starting in the 1960s, the people who wield the most cultural and political power in the country, um, they started to promote this attitude of skepticism towards marriage and monogamy. And you know, it's funny, like if you actually track like divorce rates and out of wedlock births for the, this kind of the new upper class, some people have called them, you know, people with college degrees who go to uh, expensive universities and, you know, white collar occupations. But if you look at that segment of society, in the 1970s, like divorce actually spiked quite a bit for that, that segment. Uh, and out of wedlock births increased quite a bit in the 1970s. But then by the 1980s, they had declined back to pre 1970s levels. So the story, you know, the kind of stylized fact, something like these people actually did um, kind of get high on their own supply and <laughs> you know, uh, practiced what they preached. And then they kind of realized, oh, like this actually isn't such a good idea. And they kind of reverted back to the old ways, the more conventional bourgeois family life and made those kinds of conventional choices. But those attitudes and views and policies also spread throughout the rest of society, uh, you know, through policy, but also through pop culture, through media, through the kind of general messaging that Americans overall were receiving. And so out of wedlock births and divorce and all those things spiked throughout the country, not just for the upper segment, they actually increased even more for those at the middle and the bottom of society. And they never recovered. They never actually sort of had that full circle moment the way that the elites did. And the families deteriorated and they've been kind of in free fall ever since where they never fully recovered. And my sense of this is, you know, I'm a psychologist. I focus a lot on kind of personality, cognitive profiles, individual differences. And, you know, the kind of a simplified way to understand this is if you are a highly educated, affluent, well-resourced person um, and you've been surrounded by married role models and people around you your whole life behaving and sort of modeling what a marriage and a healthy relationship looks like, um, you know, maybe you can dabble a little bit in more promiscuous habits and so on. And it's kind of a fun pastime for you. But eventually, you know, you can kind of recognize on your own and through the kind of influences around you that, oh, you know, in the end, I'll probably get married and kind of do the thing that will lead to the most likelihood, the highest likelihood of success for my children and for my family. But if you're a person who's poor, working class, not particularly educated, and you're raised by an unmarried parent, and everywhere you look, the neighborhood you live in, you're not really seeing what a healthy relationship looks like. Uh, and you know, you maybe maybe you have like as an ideal, you would like to live that life, but you know, if you are not particularly conscientious and not particularly well-resourced and, you know, you sort of lack all of the uh, sources and, and guardrails around you in order to fulfill those dreams of yours to have a married life, uh, and maybe the dreams don't even come up in the first place because you've never sort of witnessed it first that, yeah, you're going to just partake and indulge in the kind of short-term hedonistic gratification that when you're a teenager in your early 20s can be a lot of fun. But then in the wake of that, a lot of kids are born out of wedlock. A lot of people suffer. There's a lot of sort of broken uh, relationships and and conflict along the way. And yeah, I think like culture has a big, a big uh, role to, to play here. I mean, if you're someone who's raised in an upper middle class community, and again, like your parents are married every uh, parent in your neighborhood is married, your friends, like their parents, you kind of see it around you. And okay, so maybe you open social media, or you turn on the TV, or you open a magazine or listen to music, you know, kind of imbibe the pop culture around you. And it's giving you kind of these mixed messages about how, whatever, maybe you should be polyamorous, or you should, uh, you know, explore, you know, your sexuality, and you should um, indulge a bit more in short term gratification. Um, there's still that counterforce because 
what you're witnessing immediately around you, again, is your parents, your family, this upper middle class community of married people. But if you're a kid who grew up the way that I did, poor, working class, you know, not really seeing much in the way of family stability around you, and then you see those same things, you open up TikTok or social media, you listen to music, pop culture, and you're getting all these messages about, hey, just have a good time and live in a polycule or, you know, have have as much, you know, uh, uh, fun and free sex and whatever as you want um, and indulge yourself, then like that's all you're getting. Like that, that's the only information you're receiving from the world as far as like how to behave uh, in terms of romance and sexuality and so on. And so to me, it's like, you know, there was that sort of, it started in the 60s and then they never recovered. And now like it's in this kind of self-perpetuating cycle where at least in 1960, even if you wanted to do those things, at least your parents were married, but then those people had kids and those kids grew up not seeing the things that the, their parents saw. And so it's really interesting for me, at least, to speak with older people who grew up poor, because like, even though the material poverty was there, and arguably these old people that I speak with, they were poorer than I was, you know, like, we never really like, you know, there were days where, yeah, it was like, you know, we, we lacked in some ways, but like not in the same way as like before the great society programs, before mm. state benefits and so on, where they were even poorer, but they had more in the way of family and more in the way of sort of social capital in their communities. So I know this is a long answer, but no, I mean, no, not at all, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, I kind of wonder, I think the, the, the biggest question to me explaining that is what's the, the way by which it gets disseminated, right? Because I think it's sort of, especially the way that you describe it, right? There's like an upper class world and a lower class world that don't, talk that much necessarily or don't always have a great understanding of each other. So, I mean, A, is that a fair characterization of the way that you look at the current state of class in America? But B, and more importantly, if that's the case, then how does it get to be that these beliefs that are held by the upper class end up so much affecting people who are not in the upper class? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, yeah, I, I coined this term luxury beliefs yeah. um, that I write at length about in the book, and I've written in essays elsewhere and on my Substack. Luxury beliefs are ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class while inflicting costs on the lower classes. And a core feature of a luxury belief is that the believer is sheltered from the consequences of his or her belief. And so, you know, how, how does it disseminate? Again, like I think a lot of it, the luxury beliefs, some of it is through policy. Um, you know, a simple example of this would be uh, like the defund the police movement uh, that was implemented uh, into policy in many states and counties around the country. And as a result, yeah, resources to law enforcement was diverted. And but also, I mean, so that's like the policy angle. But then it, they also, you know, this movement, the defund the police movement also also cultivated an attitude of suspicion toward law enforcement. And so that's the cultural piece where like, even in areas where there wasn't an actual literal defunding of the police, the police did kind of pull back in many cases because people around them just didn't like them. And, you know, if you're a police officer and, you know, under ordinary circumstances, maybe you would intervene or if you see someone driving erratically, you would pull them over. But now because, you know, everyone has an iPhone and everyone is ready to film you uh, and if you make the slightest transgression or false move, then you can go viral and lose your job or, or worse. And so even the, the attitude and the, the culture that, that was born out in the wake of that movement had an effect um, and a downstream effect on the lower classes. So, you know, there, you've probably seen some of the statistics around, um, you know, post 2020 that homicide rates increased, violent crime rates skyrocketed. Uh, they've kind of, they've slowly over the last maybe six months to a year or so, slowly started to dip back down, still not pre-2020 levels. Uh, they're still higher than they were, but they're not quite as, as bad as they were in 2022. Um, but yeah, homicides and everything. And, and most of the victims of these crimes have been poor people and people from marginalized communities uh, because people forget that, yes, a disproportionate number of criminals come from poor and marginalized backgrounds, but so do the majority of their victims. And there are far more victims than there are criminals. Most people don't commit crimes. Most poor people don't commit crimes. Uh, but criminals tend to victimize a lot of people before, like, if if they're arrested at all. Um, and so 
to not stop crime is to actually victimize the poor and the dispossessed and the people who are actual um, in need of help. And so, so that's like that's like one example is this defund the police thing. But it can also be disseminated through like media and pop culture and so on. I mean, like right now, there's this like weird soft push around polyamory. Uh, where, you know, it seems like every other article you read in prestige media, uh, whether, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, or uh, The New Yorker, it's like, you know, they're trying to like meme polyamory into like a bigger thing than it actually is. Because statistically, only a small numerical minority of people are actually partaking in this like novel, you know, it's basically like people have always like been swingers in open marriages, but they're trying to like put this cool, fashionable spin on it. And it's always been around, but they're trying to like popularize it. It's like very strange to me. And so, you know, once the elites partake in something and make it cool and fashionable and the rest of society sees it, like, you know, people naturally sort of follow the lead of the elites. Uh, I don't tell this story in the book, but I've written about it in my Substack and other essays uh, about dueling, uh, dueling at like the, the way that Alexander Hamilton died against Aaron Burr, right? Like that style of dueling was it originally started among, you know, essentially the aristocracy in the American colonies, like Hamilton and these, like these were like the, the aristocrats of their day, the founding fathers. And um, that practice trickled throughout the rest of the colonies and eventually it was outlawed. Uh, you know, once the practice spread throughout the colonies and became a kind of common habit and practice because people emulate the elites, uh, the elites eventually kind of abandoned it. Uh, and it was eventually outlawed uh, in, I think it was in the late 19th century. Um, and and this happens uh, for all kinds of uh, other customs and habits and practices that, for better or worse, if you're a member of the elite, someone who uh, wields a lot of cultural and political and social power and influence, like, of course, like people are going to want to emulate you and to participate in that. And it's it's funny, some people will challenge me on this point where, where they'll say like, yeah, okay, so maybe the, you know, the elites will promote certain ways of life, but you point out that they're also disproportionately likely to be married and to raise their own kids in that conventional life. So, you know, are people emulating the elites or not? And my response to that would be like, privately, that's what the elites are doing. Privately, they live conventional bourgeois lives. But in terms of the content that they produce, in terms of the articles that they amplify and the TV shows and movies they make, in terms of the visible images that ordinary people are exposed to on an everyday basis, like, you know, we're, we're not getting access into the private lives of whatever, like a Hollywood director and his like normie marriage with his wife and his kids and, you know, living in a gated community. We're watching the movie he makes of like the, you know, married couple who decide to have, you know, uh, try out living in a thruple or something like that's what we're actually seeing. Uh, and so over time, I think, yeah, the images and ideals and, you know, the uh, glamorizing all of this stuff, it does have some downstream consequences. You know, I'm thinking of like, uh, when I was a kid in the late 90s, early 2000s, like, Jackass was a really popular TV show. I don't know if you're old enough to remember or know what Jackass is, but unfortunately for me, I am a huge nerd about like trashy comedy movies and TV. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So, <laughs> so I'm not alone here. Though. Yeah, little yeah. known fact for the listeners. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. you know what? So you know what I'm talking about. But like that was the heyday. Like that was when like you know every night at I don't know what it was like midnight or something on MTV yeah. you could watch Jackass. And Johnny Knoxville and Steve-O. And this was like, you know, back when they were young and like handsome and charismatic and funny. And like, and they would always have this like three second little disclaimer of like, you know, don't try these stunts at home, kids. And then like, that was it like- makes the stunt point. more appealing. For yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So you'd have the three second disclaimer and then you'd have 30 minutes or an hour or whatever it was of, you know, a bunch of really charismatic, funny guys doing the dumbest things imaginable. And then I'd go to school the next day and I would see teenage boys- you know, like shooting, mm -hmm. you know, shooting each other with paintball guns or jumping off buildings or, you know, like, uh, what, whatever, like, uh, throwing pocket knives at each other, you know, like, whatever they would see on, on Jackass, they would do to each other. Uh, and that was because, like, they were just imitating, you know, what, what to them were essentially elites, right? Like, very uh, uh, highly influential, charismatic, high visibility people, famous people. And those images do have an effect on, on behavior. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me like the most, or one of the most 
controversial or visible examples of this is hip hop culture, where famously you have things like Cardi B giving interviews where she talks about how grateful she was to be a stripper. Or there, there was a recent hit song, um, Rich Baby Daddy, by this artist, Sexy Red, who also um, writes music that really glamorizes incarceration and stuff like that. So there's, it seems like there's a big, like a actually kind of money-making machine surrounding this stuff. Um, I don't know if you, do you feel that it's, it, it, I guess it's just sort of strange the extent to which actually there's quite a lot of money or profit in glamorizing that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's, and it's that, that to me is a kind of a luxury belief too. Again, an idea or an opinion that confers status on the affluent while inflicting costs on everyone else. Well, if you are a famous musician, famous rapper, rock star, whatever, like, and you're glamorizing incarceration, you're glamorizing drug abuse. Like, you know, if you're, if you're a world famous celebrity and you get arrested, you're not going to have the same kind of prison experience as, you know, someone who is, you know, from a marginalized and poor background, uh, but you're making music for those people and you're telling them how, or being a stripper, right? Like, you know, yeah, if you can, you can glamorize it once you're already rich and comfortable and you will never actually have to live that life again, you know, but, but for everyone else, if you're, you know, some teenage girl listening to that, yeah, you know, you're not going to go on to become Cardi B, right? Like most strippers don't live that life. And a lot of them ha- end up having like severe difficulties with drugs or alcohol or abusive men. And like with drug use too. I mean, if you're a rock star and you're promoting substance abuse and glamorizing it and you yourself, you know, if you do end up uh, kind of doing what you're singing about, you know, you have money, you can hire doctors and therapists and expensive treatment facilities and find ways to get sober that way. But if you're promoting drug use to teenagers in poor areas and they're partaking in drug use, they don't, they're, they're not millionaires, right? Like they'll end up just spiraling out of control in many cases and ruining their lives. Um, and so, yeah, you're like glamorizing certain kinds of habits. I mean, it can be fun. It can be interesting and exciting, but uh, you know, it, it has like, you know, the, the term that comes to mind is this kind of disparate impact. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It does. Like it has disproportionate effects for people who aren't in the same fortunate position as you. I mean, it's, I mean, it's really interesting that like the people who wield the most power, influence, wealth in society, they suffer the the least consequences when they promote misguided and harmful ideas. And it seems like in many cases, not always, but in many cases, they are promoting ideals that uh, that are like literally like actively harmful for for everyone else, Um, even if it makes them seem interesting or fun or exotic or whatever, like it's, you know, it's like this is kind of this abdication of responsibility. One thing that I, I didn't write this in the book, but I've written it elsewhere is like, I would like to some extent like this elites used to be more comfortable with hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, and like, you know, it's like, it's like the, it's at some point along the way between the 1960s and the present, like being a hypocrite became like the worst thing you could possibly be. Like it's better to be an open scumbag than like a private scumbag who like kind of pays lip service to being a good person, but, oh, we find out that you didn't live up to your own ideals. So that means the, we should discard the ideals. And I don't right. know, like, I'm thinking about like, um, like John F. Kennedy, hmm. uh, he presented this public image of being a good father and a good husband and a family man, just like all presidents did during that period. And privately, we all kind of know he was phil- a philanderer and he wasn't such a great husband. And, you know, I don't know if he was a great father, but he was just not as great as the image he presented to the world. Uh, but I think that's a preferable model to what we have now, which is like, you know, I don't say what you will about Trump, but like, you know, Trump is like privately a scumbag and then publicly also not like the greatest role model either. And, you know, people, well, at least he tells it like it is. And at least he's, and it's like, I would rather like, you know, like people in those positions, like just of influence in general, like I, I'd rather than pay lip service, even if they don't live up to their own ideals, than like for everyone to just decide that the ideals themselves are, are, to be completely dismantled. Um, yeah, that the elites always used to be like, I, like I read this book a couple of years ago called Wasps, The Splendors and Miseries of an American Aristocracy by Michael Knox Barron. And like, you know, the wasps in the mid 20th century, like they, you know, they were swinging and cheating and philandering and all that stuff was going on behind the scenes, behind closed doors. 
but publicly they would still say like, it's still good to be married. It's still good to like, you know, raise your kids in an intact family and so on. And like now there's more and more, you know, abandoning those ideals. And now it's like, people just want to openly uh, be kind of, you know, uh, transgressive. You know, it's funny as I was, as I was kind of reflecting on all this and I was, I was reading your book as if it read my mind, the Instagram algorithm served me this video of um, the pole dancing club at Oxford. And I was like, oh my gosh, this was a thing when I was at Stanford as well. And I, it's still crazy. And I was like, this is sort of a strange trend and it's like really still going strong, but of rich kids at really, really um, elite and selective institutions doing like a strip dancing, pole dancing class because it's, then they're like, but it's such good exercise when you ask them about it. That's the response. (laughs) Yeah. It's so funny. I mean, you know, that's like a whole other rabbit hole. Cause like yeah. another um, <laughs> interest of mine is like evolutionary psychology yeah. and like about dating apps and stuff, but like that kind of, you know, the plausible deny, because I, I, I know like girl, young women who like, you know, enjoy like pole dancing class. It's like, yeah, they have this like interesting justification, whatever, but like, and then they're like posting uh, videos on Instagram and it's like very provocative and right. like, I, like, you know, I, I don't see you like posting videos of yourself running on a treadmill. You know, it's like right. this kind of very exhibitionistic, like, so. I mean, when we think about things that have really drastically changed that can change the nature kind of for poor Americans from the 50s to now. I mean, one thing that people bring up a lot is the pill. Another, I think, another kind of pill, I guess, but addiction, which was very much a kind of constant strain throughout. I mean, basically at every point in your early life story, there was another instance of addiction kind of wreaking havoc. Um, And I, I kind of wonder, I mean, you talk I mean, there's a lot of different ways of talking about it. Some people talk about it as this is just sort of a disease um, that some people are more susceptible to. And there's a sort of more old fashioned way of looking at it. Like this is a vice. This is a choice. When you look at the role of addiction, I mean, do you think that that is one of the things that's changed a lot that has made poverty worse? And kind of where do you fall within that divide? That's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's. I think it's made it worse. Uh, I don't like poverty itself. To yeah, to some extent, yes. But I mean, I think it's kind of contributed generally to like the squalor of these communities. I mean, of just people making self defeating decisions and taking the easy way out. Of you know, like I had friends who like like became addicted to pills or to marijuana or alcohol and. You know, I had one friend like this who, like, he was never not stoned. And, you know, we, like, I, I attempted at one point to, like, help him get a, a, a full-time job, higher-paying job. And he actually got hired. And then he just didn't show up for work the first day because he just would prefer getting high and kind of, you know, not, not taking responsibility for himself. And, I mean, in a weird way, this is almost like, you know, people want to blame poverty. But in some, in some ways you know, I almost want to blame the reverse of this, that in the past, you actually had to work to survive. Like my grandparents' generation, like my grandfather, my adoptive grandfather, um, he grew up in the depression. And then he he dropped out of school when he was in eighth grade, and he had to work, right? Like it almost it was almost like he didn't have time to be addicted to anything, because he just had to provide. And if he didn't work, like there was no eating. Whereas now, like, yes, there's material poverty, but it's not the same. And if you are like my friend who was, you know, you know, in, in sort of modern first world American standards, he was poor. But if he didn't work for a week, he'd still find food, right? Like, it wasn't like he would literally be sort of destitute and out on the street. Like, we've kind of arrived at this point where like, you really, like, you really have to lose yourself in addiction, or mental illness, or like, catastrophically ruin all of your relationships before you fully end up homeless uh, without any care or any, any treatment. Um, and so, yeah, in some ways it's almost like a, a, a side effect of this kind of abundance in some ways. And so, yeah, but yeah, I think, I think addiction plays some role. The pill is an interesting one too. I think it's had an effect almost Almost in, like the way that I think about it is kind of I haven't I've never heard anyone else articulate it like this, and it's something I'm still working through, which is like, you know, if you were to travel back to 1945, 
and ask Americans like, hey, in the future, there's going to be this pill that you can take and you're not going to get pregnant. And we're also going to, you know, broadly, you know, I know things are kind of been changed the last couple of years, but broadly, abortion is going to be more accessible. It's going to be legal. And again, like I know there have been things that have changed in the last couple of years, but, you know, it's going to be way more available than it was in 1945. Um, do you think, so you're, so again, you're 1945 and you're tell, telling people this, do you think that in the future, you know, with this pill, with these reproductive technologies, with abortion, do you think there will be more children born out of wedlock or fewer? Do you think that there will be more children living in orphanages and foster care and in varying states of poverty and squalor or fewer? Uh, yeah. Like what, like, what do you think? And I think, you know, most people in 1945 would hear about these miracle technologies and say like, oh, like no one's ever going to have a kid in bad circumstances ever again. Yeah. Like, there's just no way, like it just, how, how could it happen? And instead, you know, as people are aware, like things have, things have gotten worse uh, in terms of like numbers of children in foster care systems and children born out of wedlock and children who are being, you know, raised in these very difficult circumstances. And the way that I think about it is, you know, there was, there was a paper that came out in Brookings in the 90s um, uh, I think is it Janet Yellen and her husband, George Akerlof, uh, these are two economists, uh, they described how actually reproductive technologies kind of backfired uh, and had the opposite of the intended effect, such that historically, if a man got a woman pregnant, there, were, there was like extreme pressure all throughout society for them to get married. And, you know, like society would shame the man if he didn't marry the woman and the woman would, you know, have like just cause to say like, you know, hey, like, the, you know, we had sex and we got pregnant and like you have to get married. And so that's how things usually happened when there was an out of wedlock pregnancy. And after the introduction of the pill and after the introduction of widely available abortion, the norms shifted and pregnancy was primarily like thought to be like the woman's like fault or responsibility where after the pill, if a woman got pregnant, the man could basically say, like, that's not my problem. Like, you didn't take your pill or you, like, why don't you just go get an abortion? And, like, by the way, I know guys like this. Like, I, guys I grew up with in Red Bluff, like, I know stories like this of, like, some, like, you know, pregnancies and abortions and guys just taking this very cold, callous, like, that's not my problem attitude. Like, that's right. pretty common in working class areas now uh, where there's a lot of promiscuous sex and there's a lot of accidental pregnancies and women undergoing this. And that didn't used to happen when there was a lot of pressure and expectations and standards on men to take care of, you know, women who they were sleeping with. Uh, and so in the wake of all of this, essentially, like the numbers of children increased, born out of wedlock, a lot of women, you know, like they're just sort of stuck with the baby. And in most cases, like I, I just read this shocking stat that like actually most men, most absentee fathers aren't paying uh, child support. Like it's only like 40% of them or something like wow. I, didn't, I wasn't aware of this, but I was curious, like how, you know, what, what the data on that were. Um, and, you know, the other, the other part of this is like, you know, a lot of people who are in like sort of poor marginalized communities, a lot of women, I think a lot of them actually start out, like if they do have sex with men who they don't know very well, or maybe they do know them well, but they do have the intention of, okay, if, if there's a slip up or something happens or I get pregnant, that they do plan to get an abortion or take a morning after pill or something. And then they get pregnant and oftentimes like they just don't do it uh, either because they lack the resources or the means or what have you, but they just end up having the child anyway. In many cases, like there's a really interesting book called promises I can keep um, by Catherine Eden and Maria Kefalis, these two uh, Princeton sociologists. Um, and they document how like a lot of women, they get pregnant on purpose because they're like in these poor communities, they feel lonely. They don't have, you know, they're like, they have some kind of abusive or neglectful boyfriend or some, you know, the men have been horrible to them. They, you know, aren't in contact with their parents or their father, like just very like, you know, unpleasant, very kind of bleak conditions, but they have a baby because like the baby is the one thing that, the, that will love them. And the one person who they can rely on and have like a loving relationship with because they're not experiencing that anywhere else. The norms and expectations and standards have shifted so much that like a lot of these poor women are just like, I'll just have a baby and at least like someone in the world I can 
form like an innocent and loving connection with. And it's, I mean, it's really heartbreaking to read those like accounts uh, in, in this book, but that's also going on. And like that can't be accounted for in like an economic model or through sort of discussions around poverty alone. Like that's, that's also sort of a cultural issue. I definitely don't want this conversation to end without talking about the reason that you're kind of on my radar for this in the first place, which is the fact that, you know, you've written this really kind of heartrending account. And yet a lot of bookstores are not interested in promoting the book. <laughs> and it's one of those things where, I mean, the book isn't just sort of a a manifesto about luxury beliefs. It's something that seems to hit on a lot of topics that for kind of mainstream left-wing academic society actually are really important core topics. And so I kind of wonder from, from your perspective, what it is you think about it. Do you think it's because of kind of the other aspects of your profile where you are kind of more conservative and had been affiliated with that for a long time? Or do you think that there's actually something kind of content wise and what you're talking about that really strikes a nerve well, I mean, it, it, it's funny, you're getting me at an interesting time. So I, uh, I just, so, so there's the bookstore issue where, you know, essentially I was supposed to do this kind of mini book tour doing signings and maybe doing some talks at bookstores, but none of them were willing to host me. Um, and these, these are in big cities like New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, like, yeah, they, yeah, my publicist uh, at my, you know, at Simon and Schuster, they contacted a bunch of these places and none of them were interested in hosting me. Um, and then yesterday, uh, I received word that uh, my book made the USA Today bestseller list, and it's um, it's been doing like extremely well in terms of raw sales, in terms of interest and reception and buzz and everything. Uh, but it didn't make the New York Times bestseller list, and oh, my publisher was was shocked by this. Like they, even there, like something fishy happened here, and they're actually inquiring into oh, like why God. this oversight occurred, uh, and so. You know, and it was like number one across multiple categories on Amazon and like basically like every on every other metric, like it's, you know, done very well. But then the New York Times list came out and it's so funny. Like that's crazy. I, I looked at it. The list just came out like they updated every Wednesday. I don't yeah, I just looked at it last night and um, the two new books that are on the list. They're both like, like one of them is like about uh, how divorce can be empowering for women. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other book wow. was like, memoir. the other book was a memoir of like, you know, this woman's uh, self-discovery after she ended her marriage and her subsequent relationship with her daughter. And like, and I'm like, you know, there's like a theme here, but like wow. but my book, you know, like. It's, uh, it's just why people believe conspiracy theories. I know, that, I know too it's, much. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard not to think. Oh that my god! Happened here, and so you know, between the bookstore, you know, being frozen out of the bookstore promo circuit, and then this weird thing happening with the bestseller list, and like a lot of people don't know this, but like the New York Times bestseller list is essentially like holistic admissions, where it's like you know, you you do have to meet like a certain number of sales performance, but then beyond that, like the tastemakers at the newspaper kind of curate it and decide mm -hmm. like which of these books are a good fit, which one of them, th them have like a message that should be amplified and receive more attention and buzz and so on. And so it's kind of a, you know, it's not exactly a bestseller list. It's kind of like a list that the elites, you know, want you to know about these books. Uh, and so, yeah, there's something strange that happened there. Um, but I think, yeah, what the, the reasons you described, the message is kind of unwelcome. It's kind of, you know, a lot of the book is me describing the conditions that I grew up in and the kind of bleak and difficult conditions in a lot of communities in the country. And later on in the book, I kind of point out the hypocrisy and the duplicity and the short-sightedness of elites in the country and the people who wield the most influence over policy and culture are so far removed from these communities you know, in many cases on, on whose behalf they claim to speak or on whose behalf they claim to have, you know, their best interest in mind. Uh, but these places are getting worse and people are suffering even more uh, despite this renewed interest in social justice and uh, helping the downtrodden. And instead, what seems to be happening is like, yes, we're seeing more quote unquote diversity in elite spaces. Um, but as far as like the communities that have, you know, disproportionate numbers of historically mistreated and marginalized groups, 
uh, whether, you know, non-white or poor or what have you, like they're actually not getting better. Uh, inequality has been widening, uh, children like now, you know, like, especially in the wake of like the lockdowns and the school system and everything, like, you know, learning outcomes have been deteriorating, like basically across every measure, kids are just suffering more and more. Um, and people in these communities, not just the kids. Uh, and so I describe this and I think there's just like this feeling of let's try not to, you know, let's not, let's try not to, um, involve ourselves in that discussion too much, or let's try to tiptoe around it and see if we can just kind of let it blow by and not engage with it. Um, you know, now that being said, like, you know, I, a lot of journalists and a lot of people at prestige media have contacted me and, you know, it's not a monolith. I don't think it's like you're describing, I don't think it's an actual conspiracy, but I do <laughs> disproportionate number of people in these institutions are, uh, not particularly excited about the message in my book. There are people within them, like everywhere else, right? Like I've, I've spoken at length about the uh, self-inflicted controversies at elite universities and how they are kind of losing their bearings a little bit. But within universities, there are still good people and still good research being done and all those things. And I think it's kind of the same at the media. Like a lot of them, you know, these institutions do kind of have a overall a shared outlook and a little bit of an agenda but within them there are still good people who are still trying their best to shine light on these issues so and i've been speaking with those people so it's not again it's like it's, it's <laughs> hard to condemn them wholesale but yeah, clearly yeah, yeah. something you know I, I i imagine you know like if my book you know was like hey I don't know, like i grew up in foster care and i was poor and blah 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 and then at the end i'm like and that's why you should be in a polyamorous relationship. I think like the book might be received a little differently. I, don't know. <laughs> I might be over, you know, I might be overstating things, but I do think like if the message were different, yeah. I would be treated differently. Yeah. If you could crystallize just in a few words, what it is kind of specifically about your message that people are not reacting well to at places like the New York Times bestseller list. Hmm. I mean, what are they not reacting to? Well, I mean, I think even the, the idea of luxury beliefs of pointing out that the people who are championing these views, defund the police or or what have you, um, you know, revamping the curriculum at public schools to focus more on identity politics rather than reading and writing, that maybe it allows, you know, the anointed to pat themselves on the back and feel like they're doing something good, uh, when actually the side effects are like you get to elevate your status a bit, you receive plaudits from other people in your social circle in, you know, among your fellow uh, college graduates, your fellow elites or quasi elites or aspirational elites. But the downstream consequences are actually inflicting a lot of harm. And I point this out in kind of an unflinching, unsugarcoated way. And I just, you know, that's uncomfortable for a lot of people to have their um, mistakes reflected back at them from someone who knows something about, you know, what it's like to live in these conditions, you know, very far removed from, from a lot of other people who, who work in, in media. All right. Very last question. I pinky promise. Um, I mean, it must be really exciting for you to now be like a published book author, given that you talk so powerfully in your memoir about how much books have kind of meant to you throughout your life. There were a couple that I noticed came up multiple times. You mentioned George Orwell a few times and as well as Stephen Pinker and Jonathan Haidt. But if you had to pick, let's say, three books that radically kind of changed your life and shifted your perspective, what would they be? How many books? Sorry? Three. Three. Oh, oh man, that's hard. No, we can, we can make it five. I'm willing to adjust okay. to five. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Let's keep it to three because otherwise three. I don't, you know, okay. that, well, actually, five, well, five might make it, I don't know. I'll just list a few, see what happens. Uh, so there's this really great book uh, that should have made the bestseller list called Troubled um, by Rob Henderson. <laughs> I would, uh, no, I, uh, no, no, that's, um, although I would recommend it. It's, it's, <laughs> It'll be linked in the show notes. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. So, so three books that I, I mean, it's hard to like just pick a few. I mean, it depends on what your interests are. Like, I, I mean, I recommend books all the time. Well, for you, like that, that had a big impact on you. But for me, oh man, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, I listed Orwell a bunch of times just because, I mean, his, and, and I'm like, uh, everyone knows about like 1984, Animal Farm. Actually, Animal Farm, I might, that might be one of them. Wow, interesting. It's, like, it's really worth, I think, like reading and rereading 
um, <laughs> to just like, you know, to understand how, you know, the desire for equality can go so horribly awry and how conformity and, you know, towing of the party line can, you know, how, how, how people can sort of be manipulated into behaving in, you know, under, under the guise of justice. So that's like, that's one, but you know, for, for lesser known, I think Down and Out in Paris and London by Orwell is an excellent mm -hmm. book. It's kind of, you know, Orwell himself grew up like British middle class, which is like, you know, basically the equivalent of like upper middle class in America. You know, he went to Eton and he like, but you know, he, so the book is kind of like slum tourism, but he does describe in sort of uh, unsparing and beautiful language, like what he saw among the poor and working class in London and Paris during his time that, you know, this is like the early, early to mid 20th century really profound book. Um, you know, I'm thinking now I'm thinking like memoirs. Uh, there's a book um, called Life and Death in Shanghai by um, this woman, Nian Chang, who describes her experiences during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, she was like wrongly imprisoned and you know, her daughter was killed. And she just is basically describing like how communism kind of spiraled out and like ideology rapidly took over the country and how, you know, there are like kind of eerie parallels to what we saw post 2020 in the US of just how, again, under the guise of justice, under the guise of equality and all these things, like people can convince themselves that they're doing the right thing when they're actually inflicting a lot of suffering uh, on the people around them. Um, and yeah, Pinker, Pinker's book, How the Mind Works is really, you know, if you just have one, like a, a cursory introductory level apology uh, survey uh, How the Mind Works by Stephen Pinker is really good. There's a more recent psychology book called Psych by Paul Bloom. Hmm, okay. uh, that's also really good. It's like kind of a, a, a beginner's tour of psychology. Um, other other books. There's a short story I really like called uh, Babylon Revisited by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, and it's just like a really hmm. again, like a beautifully written short story about uh, regret and the fragility of forgiveness and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I don't know what other, what other I mean, there's just, so there's so many. We're, we're, we're at six, so you don't, <laughs> yeah, are we at six? Oh, I'm sorry. Need to apologize. Yeah, okay. it's, I mean, the, yeah, super interesting. Okay. <laughs> I can talk about books all day. But yeah, that's, that's but yeah, I really, really appreciate your time. Your memoir will be linked in the show notes. So the listeners should absolutely check it out. Thank you. That sounds good. Well, there you have it, Madisonians, Dr. Rob Henderson on his new memoir, Troubled, which is linked in the show notes if you want to check it out. You can also find out more about us and what we do at the Madison Program at jmp.princeton.edu. There, you'll have access to the entire archives of all of our previous lectures here on Princeton's campus, our schedule of upcoming events. You can sign up for our mailing list, and you can find out more about our mission here at Princeton. You can also follow us on social media, on Twitter at Madison Program, as well as on Instagram and Facebook. And last but not least, please do leave us ratings and reviews, especially on Apple Podcasts. We really do read them and really, really appreciate feedback. As always, thank you so much for tuning in, and I can't wait to join you again next week here on Madison's Notes.